Hi class, today I just want to do a quick review and overview of ecology. I think that a lot of you have learned ecology in your previous classes. I usually end the year with ecology, but I like to talk and touch on a few of the main topics and terms just as a recap at the beginning. So the first thing I want to talk about is the definition. In the previous vi video, we talked about the um, organization of life and one of the terms in that organization of life was eco was ecosystem. So ecosystems are all living and non-living things in a specific area. But ecology is pretty much all the ecosystems, but how all the living and non-living things interact with each other and the environment. And so ecology is just a study of the ecosystems and how all living and non-living things interact. Whether it's a forest, whether it's a desert, whatever part of the world we're talking about, there are living and non-living things that interact with each other. And in those ecosystems, there are organisms, and the organisms have habitats and niches. A habitat is, habitat is simply where an organism lives, where the niche is actually what it does. And it's how it gets its food, how it finds a mate, how it raises its young, how it gets more water, how it gets more sun if it's a plant. So the habitat is where the organism lives, but the niche is kind of its role, what it does, how, how it lives. Every organism has a slightly different niche. No two different species have the exact same niche. No, not all parts of their niche can overlap. But some niches do overlap. And so in this bottom picture, we have some different birds. They're different species of warblers. And they all like to nest in trees. But their niches are very specific, whereas one species nests at the top, one in the middle, and one at the bottom. So um, there's competition for these different areas. With a koala bear, koalas are very specific. Their habitat is in Australia, and they have a very specific niche that no other organism fills because it eats eucalyptus leaves for its nourishment. And so habitat and niche. Invasive species. There are lots of invasive species here in Ohio, and these are two of them that I'm going to talk about quickly. But simply, an invasive species is an organism that is in a place that it shouldn't be. It's not native to an area. <clears throat> and when you bring in something that's not typically found in an area and you bring it in, it's very likely to cause harm. It disrupts the natural ecosystem. It starts to um, disturb and disturb normal species that are living in that area and so invasive is or they're kind of like invaders of a certain area now sometimes they're purposely introduced sometimes they're accidentally introduced and sometimes they're naturally introduced the two that i'm going to talk about in ohio that we have here are, are the emerald ash borer and the zebra mussels the emerald ash borer borer is an insect that bores into ash trees specifically and it's green so that's where it gets its name but this Usually, it's not a normal species here. Ash trees are. What this insect does is it burrows little, it bores little holes in the trees, in the ash trees, and then it lays its eggs. And when the eggs hatch, it eats the, it eats the um, nutrition, it steals the nutrition from the ash tree from the inside and it kills it. And so a lot of ash trees that have ash trees have actually died in this area because of that and so they were trying to find a way to regulate and kill a lot of these emerald ash borers. So obviously they're causing harm and disrupting the natural ecosystem by competing with different species because their niches overlap. Over here we have zebra mussels. Zebra mussels got introduced into Lake Erie and all the rest of the Great Lakes through um, the hulls. They were stuck on the hulls of ships as they came in through the St. Lawrence Seaway and they were introduced into the Great Lakes and they started to kind of take over and they competed with other species and they're just kind of over reproducing they're all over the place whereas other species are starting to decline because their niches overlap and there's high competition for the resources to stay alive so those are invasive species the next thing I want to recap is energy all living things need energy it's one of the characteristics of life and I want to talk about the definition of energy. You probably, probably learned that energy is the ability to do work or cause change. And those are fine definitions. I prefer this definition. Energy is not matter, but can change matter. So energy is not matter, 
remember that matter is anything that has mass and takes up space, but it can change that thing. The sun, of course, is the ultimate source of energy, and I'm, pr I'm sure that you've learned lots of different types of energy, like potential and kinetic and light and thermal and all those different ones. We're going to focus on chemical, we're going to focus on heat, we're going to focus on a couple of these throughout the year in biology. Now, energy, energy, a lot of people have trouble understanding this, but energy does not get recycled uh, in our on our Earth. It actually is unidirectional. So the sun supplies it to the producers, and then the producers get eaten by the herbivores, the herbivores get eaten by the carnivores through the food chains and webs that I'm going to talk about, and the energy gets passed along, and it dissipates, and it gets less and less and less every time it gets passed along. And eventually it runs out. So energy flows. It's unidirectional. unidirectional. But matter, anything that has mass or takes up space, is constantly recycled. Matter can neither be created nor destroyed. And so it's just broken down and forms something new. And so in these pictures, I just have, this is a very simple food chain showing the sun, providing, um, going through the different levels, passing on energy to the next organism, and heat, which is a form of energy being lost. So it's being passed and lost. Um, that's being shown up here as energy is being passed along as well. Now, to get that energy, you have to have some nourishment. So you either make your own or you go on out and consume your own. If you're an autotroph, you're a producer, you probably do photosynthesis, and you're probably a plant, but there's a few other things that do photosynthesis as well. And there are heterotrophs, which are consumers, and we are a consumer. We have to go out and find our own food. There's omnivores, carnivores, herbivores, decomposers, detritivores. There's different types of heterotrophs, and those are the two main methods. Now, all that energy and gets passed along through the autotrophs and the heterotrophs in an ecosystem through food webs and chains. And so as the energy gets transferred, uh, they could be a linear or it most, but when you take the whole ecosystem, it's more very messy and complex and it turns into a food web. And so the energy in a food chain or food web shows where the energy is going, not who eats what. That's a common mistake not who eats what, but where is the energy going. So in this picture, we have the mouse pointing to the bird, and we know that the mouse doesn't eat the bird, but the energy from the mouse is going to the bird. So the energy is, it's showing where the energy is going, not who eats what. And this is just a great picture of a food chain. And so the energy from the flower is going to the bee, the energy from the bee is going to the dragonfly, to the frog and to the snake. And so that is where the energy is going. Ecological pyramids show the flow of energy through an ecosystem. And so energy is unidirectional. It gets less and less and less as it gets passed on. So we have food pyramids, not the type of nutrition that you need to eat, but these are the ones that show how there's producers on the bottom and the top carnivores at the top and how we have more of these organisms and less of those based on amount of energy. But as the energy gets passed up in our trophic levels, energy, only 10% of the energy is passed along. So if the sun supplies a million units of energy called joules, then only 100,000 units go to the flower. And of the flower, only 10% of that goes to the grasshopper, etc. So it gets less and less and less each time. The biogeochemical cycles talk about matter. Energy flows, matter recycles. So matter, anything that has mass or takes space, gets recycled through our atmosphere and through our earth all the time. And these are the big cycles that you learn, like the water cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the um, carbon dioxide, there's carbon cycle, there's, there's a bunch of them and I'm sure that you've learned them, but this just shows how those atoms are one thing and then they become another and then they become another and eventually come, they come back around to the original thing again. Just like you take this chemical equation, we're, we're going to do some chemistry. If you take methane and oxygen, these are the atoms that are that makes it up, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and if you do a chemical reaction and rearrange them, they form carbon dioxide and water. Same atoms, but just rearranged. That's what matter does on our planet. Now, the last thing I want to talk about are the symbiotic relationships. The symbiotic relationships are simply a symbiosis is a relationship between two organisms that live in the same area. And there's three different types, I'm sure that you've heard of them, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. In mutualism, both benefit. And so this, 
this is a zebra and a bird called the oxpecker. And what the oxpecker birds do is pick off parasites and, and uh, fleas and flies and stuff that irritate the zebra and the giraffe and the other organisms. And so what happens is the bird gets food, the zebra gets rid of a parasite, and everybody's happy. So it's a mutualistic relationship. Commensalism is when one benefits and the other is not affected. So in the scenario of the shark and the remora fish, the shark swims around and when it eats, the remora fish gets the leftovers and the little niblets that are left over after the shark feeds. So what the remora fish does is it actually latches onto the shark and hitches a ride. And when the shark eats, the remora fish eat too. The shark is not affected at all and it doesn't, the remora fish doesn't hurt it at all. So, but the fish is getting definitely a huge benefit of getting its food by hanging around with the shark. And parasitism is when one benefits and the other one is harmed. And so some caterpillars are the victims of some parasitic wasps. What these wasps do is they lay their eggs actually on and in the caterpillars. That's gross. But when the eggs hatch, now the Hatchlings have a food source and they eat the caterpillar. And so obviously that's not a good thing for that guy. All right. And so these are the main terms I wanted you to kind of recap and go over and take some notes on. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you.